So could you start by explaining uh, the mechanism that you're hoping to bring together? You know, you've advanced the timelines, brought out a paper which looks at regulating crypto assets. So many people who trade uh, or were trading in crypto assets, very curious to know how exactly will this function? Yeah, this is one of the big achievements of India's G20 presidency, which is to bring together when it comes to crypto assets, not just the regulatory aspect, but also the macro financial consequences. So for the first time, they brought together the Financial Stability Board, who does regulation, and the IMF, who does macro financial stability, and said, come together from that holistic perspective, what kind of policy actions are needed. So for instance, when it comes to monetary issues, you know, one of the clear statements is do not legalize the use of any crypto asset like Bitcoin for legal currency, because that would affect monetary sovereignty. When it comes to financial stability, the guideline is to make sure that you have such issuers of such crypto assets, that they are licensed, that they're registered, and you have the principle that if it's the same activity, same risk, then you have the same action in terms of the way you treat it. So it's laid out a, a very good set of broad principles. The work is not over because there's a roadmap in terms of what else needs to be done going forward. But this is the first time the global community has come together and agreed on a common set of principles. So the good thing is there's no talk of banning crypto. I mean, the idea that crypto is tough to ban has kind of gone through. But what, what concerns me is that different countries have adopted different positions on the spectrum of policy making and dealing with crypto assets. Do you think this provides a common framework, I ask, because the G20 regulations or whatever comes out of the G20 isn't necessarily binding? That's certainly right. And there cannot be one size fits all, just given the complexity of the world and different levels of financial development, the kinds of supervision and regulation they can have and so on. So there is going to be some tailoring to country specific circumstances. But everybody agreed that these broad principles were all on board with. Okay, do you want to give those watching a broad sense of what to expect once these principles are indeed accepted and the kind of timelines that you're looking at at this moment uh, for these principles to be brought into policy? I think it's going to be much less of the Wild West that we've had for a long time by throwing light on the different uh, issuers of these kinds of crypto assets, we're going to have much better data of what they're doing, what the extent to which they're penetrating into different, uh, you know, different people's pockets. There is going to be, if, it, if it's clear that you are effectively a speculative investment class, then you're going to be regulated in one way. If you're being used for payments, then you're going to be regulated as other payment systems are regulated. It's going to take some time to build up the specific details of it but uh, much more transparency, much more you know, light being shed on it, and not the anything goes kind of environment. Let's spend a moment on your reading of the Indian economy at the moment, uh, seen as one of the key growth engines of the global economy. Uh, India projected to grow at 6.1% 2023, 6.3% next year. Uh, but concerns also being asked about, raised about uh, private investment and private investment not kick-starting in quite the way the government would have liked. So do you want to share your reading of how you think the economy is doing at this moment? Now, India is uh, and continues to be an engine of global growth. So we have, uh, for this fiscal year, we expect growth to be over 6%. And two factors that are driving it are public investment, which has been quite strong, and resilient consumption spending. So I think those are the two important factors. I mean, our estimate is that for this year, for 2023, India's growth would explain about 15% of global growth, right? So that is a substantial chunk of global growth that's being driven by uh, India at this point. But to get to much higher levels of per capita income and to get to continued high levels of growth, you need structural reforms, and that's going to be very important and there are multiple fronts on which these reforms will be needed. Those will be needed also to attract private investment. You know, a lot has been put in place in terms of improving the ease of doing business, but there is still a lot more that Do needs to be done. you want to spend a moment talking about that because this government heads into an election and of course all of what you're saying is not linked to elections, but of all the structural reforms that you'd like the government to push through, uh, what is it that you think could have the biggest multiplier and the 
fastest improvement in the level of private investment. So creating an enabling environment for private investment, clearly very important. On that front, continuing the investment in public infrastructure, hugely important. Digital public infrastructure is playing a very important role. But in addition to that, you know, some of the harder decisions when it comes, for instance, to labor markets is needed. Now, that's not something that the center can do because you put, uh, I mean, there's a clearly reforms have been announced for labor market reforms, but many states have not implemented them yet. So that's going to be required. So if you actually see in terms of where foreign direct investment goes in India, there are about four states. There's Maharashtra, Karnataka, Gujarat, Gujarat Delhi that get a lot of a big chunk of the investment and it's not going to other parts. So a lot has to be done at the level of state governments. Secondly, of course, uh, again, what I said about the ease of doing business, that it's still the case that there, are, there is a fair amount of red tape in opening uh, businesses in India. That's going to take uh, some work. Education, in terms of improving the quality of education, making it, you know, there are some fantastic institutions over here, but the depth of it uh, needs to be improved. More work on that front. Female labor force participation is way lower than what it should be at this level of, uh, of development in India. It's very low. Mm -hmm. That Raising that up would make a big difference. So these are some of the reforms that would be helpful. You may have seen uh, some commentary recently about concerns being raised internationally about whether the government is overstating economic growth. Came out 7.8%. Uh, was the estimate that was uh, put out recently. Is that a concern that you have? Because that's been a big concern somewhere else and now there's this controversy. So I'm kind of wondering what's your reading of it? No, this is not something that we, uh, we are concerned about. Um, you know, we look at a bunch of data. We look at lots of high frequency data and so on. And, uh, you know, these are the numbers that we take. Let's spend a moment on digital public infrastructure, which has been one of India's uh, big s ideas during this G20 presidency and you travel internationally, you're seeing what's happening in global economies. Do you really think India's tech stack is of as much utility internationally as the government hopes it can be? I think India is really on the forefront in this area. Uh, it is, I mean, it's already seen the benefits for India itself. I mean, not just in terms of innovation and what it's brought in, but also on the fiscal front in terms of much more, much more efficient spending, the ability to collect revenues, formalizing the economy, all of that has been phenomenal. I mean, that India is, is really a leader in that front and other countries in the world are paying attention to what India is doing in this space. Do you see other countries wanting to adopt these technologies? Do you see this as being a part of what India can export in terms of ideas and tech globally? I think it already is doing that actually. It is absolutely exporting those ideas. There is now a push to make sure that we have platforms that are interoperable, uh, that you know, speak across borders, because clearly you know, there are different forms. There's PIX in Brazil, which has the features of India's UPI, but at the same time is different in other respects. And the question is whether you can have a much more integrated uh, platform. Uh, there's work being done on that front. But, you know, organically, a lot of these exchange of ideas is happening. Let's spend a moment on your reading of the Chinese economy at the moment, which is one of the big concern areas. Uh, the obituary of growth in China has been written often and has always proven wrong. But there are also concerns that maybe this time the distress is deeper and more real than it has been in the past. How do you read all the data that's coming or not coming out of China? Now, after a first uh, quarter that was very strong because of the rebound from the reopening, China's economy has slowed. And we see that in private consumption. The real estate sector, of course, is, has had a lot of trouble for a long time. Uh, and we saw some improvement in the first few months of this year. But then again, we're seeing a deterioration. So that is an area of important concern. So private, in so investment is just down. Confidence is down, consumer confidence, and just broadly private sector confidence is down. Now, the good news is that China has the resources to be able to turn things around. It still can do much more in terms of fiscal policy and in terms of monetary policy, and they are taking actions in that dimension. But you know, these are things that not, can't necessarily be turned around overnight. I mean, we expect, China's growth to slow. Um, you know, 
for this year, for instance, we still think that it can meet the target that the government has set of about 5%. But then in, into the medium term, we have China's growth projected at around 3.4% you know, uh, going down. So that's where we are. It's not like we're expecting to see a very deep downturn or a sharp recession or anything of that kind, but just slowing growth. So slowing growth at this level of economic evolution is understandable. But there are people who take it one step further and say, because, for example, youth unemployment, June was 21%, before they shut off uh, unemployment data, they say the distress is much deeper and darker than the mandarins in Beijing would have us believe. Well, it's more than just saying that it, China's reached the size of an economy where the growth slows down, right? It's certainly more than that, because we have revised down our projections for China relative to the pre-pandemic, given the developments we've seen in the property And in your sector. revised projections, is there a point where China still overtakes the U.S.? Because that's become a matter of uh, global commentary about whether China ever does overtake the U.S. in terms of the size of the economy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, given the downgrade, it's going to take longer. Whether it will or will not will depend upon what kinds of policies the government does uh, uh, take at this point. Like I said, it has the space to be able to make, uh, make changes to its uh, economic path. But the combination of what we're seeing in terms of the property sector, the, the slowing confidence, the fact that the global demand, especially for manufactured goods, has come down quite a bit. I mean, all of this uh, are headwinds for China. We saw the U.S. Uh, Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, when she was in Beijing yes, uh, recently, speak about China becoming increasingly uninvestable, that ad hoc economic decision making is making it very complicated for American companies, international companies to invest in China. Do you see this uh, pulling away or this, uh, you know, not necessarily decoupling, but reducing interdependence being now cast in stone? Or do you think there, there is likely to be an economic rapprochement uh, more than we've seen so far? No, I do think that we are in a time of uh, geoeconomic fragmentation. We're certainly seeing these geopolitical tensions are showing up in countries, you know, moving away from each other. For instance, uh, Rahul, if you look at the uh, import restrictions that have been put, last year 3,000 new import restrictions were put. That was three times the number that was put in 2019. And if you look at where FDI is going, it's much more driven by now geopolitical considerations as opposed to geographic distance, which used to be a bigger role. So we are certainly seeing countries uh, distancing themselves in terms of the amount of integration, the relative to how much of integration they had in the past. You know, the whole language of we're trying to de-risk and not decouple, I think it's fine. It's much more harder to do in practice uh, and not go down a slippery slope. So this is a challenge for the world and we've been at the IMF I mean this is one of our jobs is to flag the risks to the to the world from this 